Good morning. If we could quiet our hearts and take our seats and turn our attention to the Lord and watch the, the screen and, and think of the thoughts that are that are on the on the screen. As we begin and open our time of worship together, I invite you to stand if you are able. And we're going to open with the song, Worship His Majesty. Majesty, majesty, worship His Majesty. Lord, to give up, I'd be a fool. You 
It's interesting, the, uh, the first screen of the prelude talked about that we should talk to each other in, in psalms. So I'd like to read a, a psalm, actually a portion of a psalm, Psalm 103. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquities, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from destruction, who crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies, who satisfies your mouth with good things, so that your youth is renewed like the eagle's. And then from the beginning of Psalm 104, Bless the Lord, O my soul. O Lord, my God, you are very great. You are clothed with honor and majesty, who cover yourself with light as with a garment, who stretch out the heavens like a curtain. We serve a mighty God. Let us magnify his name and worship him. I'd like to call the, the ushers up at this time, and Joan Salas will give the offertory prayer. Thank you. 
Let us pray. <clears throat> Our Father in heaven, we thank you today for the privilege of being here to worship you. Thank you for each person who is here. Thank you that we have the privilege of meeting together. We pray that we, that you will, we will worship you in spirit and in truth today, that you will guide our thoughts, help us to concentrate on you and your majesty. Thank you for the monies that have been contributed today. We pray that you will bless the offering to further your kingdom, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Yesterday, I attended the funeral of a 95-year-old saint over here at the Colebrookdale Chapel. And I think one of my favorite pictures of the church is the church singing at a funeral of a saint. I just, I, I just, I relish that beauty and that hope and that strength that the church, in the midst of grief, the church sings on. And I just think that's such a wonderful um, beauty and a gift that the church, that we, the church, have to sing on, to sing of the hope we have in our God, in our faithful God and Savior. We'd like to open this time of worship by singing about our King, Amazing Love. Jesus, you are my king. 
Jesus, you are mighty. In your worship book, if you'd like to turn to it, we're going to sing about the story of two, it begins with two fishermen um, that Jesus called two fishermen. <laughs> By grace, God doesn't leave you on your own. He doesn't leave you with the toolbox of your own strength, your own righteousness, and your own wisdom. No. He invades you with his presence, power, wisdom, and grace. Paul captures this reality with these life-altering words. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. He's obviously not saying that he's dead, because if he was, he wouldn't be writing these words. No, he's reminding you and me of a very significant spiritual reality. Here it is. If you are God's child, the life force that energizes your thoughts, desires, words, and actions is no longer yours. It's Christ. God didn't just forgive you. No, he has come to live inside of you, so you will have the power to desire and do what he calls you to do. 
And not only does he live inside of you, he rules all the situations, locations, and relationships that are out of your control. He is not only your indwelling savior, he is your reigning king. He does in you what you could not do for yourself. And he does outside of you what you have no power or authority to do. And he does all of this with your redemptive good in mind. Who you say I am.
The scripture reading for today is from Matthew chapter 9, verses 36 through 38. And just to be clear, the he in this uh, passage is referring to Jesus, when Jesus. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion for them, because they were weary and scattered, like sheep having no shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest truly is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Blessings to you, Roland, as you give us the word. As I was typing out my sermon and pecking away on my laptop, I thought I should have done better, maybe paid more attention when I had typing class in school. But there was nobody back in 1977, there was nobody that would have convinced a 16-year-old farm boy with fat fingers that Typing was worth something that was worth learning, but I was wrong. A pastor and his wife were keeping their two young grandchildren at their house for the weekend. On Sunday morning, they went to church. After the service, the granddaughter was in tears as they were walking out. With many of the congregation around them noticing what was going on, the pastor asked her, what was wrong? She responded, I didn't get to see any clowns. Grandpa, I heard you said that there were clowns in the pews on Sunday morning. <laughs> well, we're not clowns, although at times we may do foolish or silly things. We may make mistakes and embarrass ourselves, the preacher included, but that's okay. The church is not about being perfect. The church is about knowing the one who is. My message title is Because of Who You Are. This title is only part of the whole title of my message. I took it from a song done by probably my favorite contemporary Christian artist, Casting Crowns, entitled, Who Am I? The words are, not because of who I am, but because of what you've done. Not because of what I've done, but because of who you are. Since this seemed too long a title, I shortened it and left in the most important part. I'm tweaking the meaning of, these, of this phrase a little from the intent, intent of the song, but it fits my message very well. It's not about my or our qualifications, but it's about what God can do through me or us. Following is a clip I found from 1,000 stories and quotations of famous people, compiled by Wayne E. Warner. When evangelist J. Wilbur Chapman was in London, he had an opportunity to meet General William Booth, a Methodist preacher who founded the Salvation Army. At that time, he was past 80 years of age, Dr. Chapman listened quietly as the old general spoke of the trials and the conflicts and the victories. Then the American evangelist asked 
the general, if he would disclose the secret of his success. He hesitated a second, Dr. Chapman said, and I saw the tears come to his eyes and steal down his cheeks. And then he said, I'll tell you the secret. God has had all there is of me. There have been men with greater brains than I, men with greater opportunities, but from the day I got the poor of London on my heart and the vision of what Jesus Christ could do with the poor of London, I made up my mind that God would have all of William Booth there was. And if there's anything of power in the Salvation Army today, it's because God has all the adoration of my heart, all the power of my will, and all the influence of my life. Dr. Chapman said he went away from that meeting with General Booth knowing that the greatness of a man's power is in the measure of surrender. Let's pray. <clears throat> Dear God, I pray that you will bless our time here together. May the words I speak be from you, and may they be an encouragement to all. In your name I pray, amen. Not because of what I've done, but because of who you are. Lee read the text from Matthew 9, verses 36 to 38, and I'll read it again from the New Living Translation. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were confused and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. He said to his disciples, The harvest is great, but the workers are few. So pray to the Lord who is in charge of the harvest. Ask him to send more workers into the fields. While Jesus was traveling around teaching and preaching, he saw the large, large crowds of people. He saw how lost they looked, how they were looking for something different. They were looking for some direction. He felt sorry for them, like sheep without a shepherd. He needed help to carry out his mission. He asks his disciples to pray, to ask God to send more workers. Maybe Jesus was hoping for the same response that Isaiah gave in chapter 6 of the book of Isaiah, when in response to a vision he had from God, he said, Here am I, send me. In any case, we continue in chapter 10 of Matthew with Jesus calling his disciples together and giving them authority to do miracles. They became apostles. They went from learners or disciples to apostles who were one who was sent out to represent. Who were these disciples? Several were fishermen, probably from a rougher crowd, not quite as refined. One was a tax collector, probably unpopular, maybe a cheater, but a traitor to the Jews because he was working for the Roman government. At least one was a political activist. One could make the argument that several were pushing for Jesus to rule an earthly kingdom in military style. Some were formal, former disciples of John the Baptist, and one was a skeptic. These men had backgrounds that varied. They were not from nobility. They were common people. Maybe some from lower economic class. 
They left what they were doing to follow Jesus. They had willing hearts, but they had flaws. Following are ideas I took from an article by Thomas Kilpatrick entitled, Five Flaws of the Apostles. Here are five areas where the disciples lacked. One, the disciples lacked spiritual understanding. Luke chapter 18, verses 31 through 34. Taking the twelve disciples aside, Jesus said, Listen, we're going up to Jerusalem where all the predictions of the prophets concerning the Son of Man will come true. He will be handed over to the Romans and he will be mocked, treated shamefully, and spit upon. They will flog him with a whip and kill him. But on the third day, he will rise again. But they didn't understand any of this. The significance of his words was hidden from them, and they failed to grasp what he was talking about. Jesus was telling them the time had come for the Old Testament prophecies to be fulfilled. You can see back in Isaiah 53, those prophecies. For three years, the disciples learned from Jesus, yet still they could not connect the dots from the Old Testament. Peter stated that he believed Jesus was the Messiah, but what kind of a Messiah? They hadn't grasped the idea that he had to die and then rise again. Number two, the disciples lacked humility. From the prophecy in Isaiah 9, Jesus' followers were looking for an earthly king, one who would drive out their oppressors and set up a new kingdom. What would be their position in the new kingdom? In Matthew chapter 20, verses 20 and 21, James and John devise a plan to, set their, to get their mother to request to Jesus that her sons sit on his right and his left. Or maybe it was the mother pushing for her boys to be in the spotlight. At any rate, when the other disciples heard of this, they were very irritated. You can see this in verse 24. At another time, in Mark chapter 9, verses 33 and 4, it says, after they arrived at Capernaum and settled in a house, Jesus asked his disciples, What were you discussing out on the road? But they didn't answer, because they had been arguing about which of them was the greatest. In Luke's account, they even asked Jesus which of them was the greatest. They didn't understand Jesus' concept of the first shall be last. Jesus taught his disciples by taking a basin of water and a towel and washing their feet. Jesus taught by displaying his own humility. As disciples, we have been commissioned to serve. Number three, the disciples lacked faith. The disciples believed Jesus was the Messiah. Andrew stated that in John chapter 1, verse 41. And in Mark chapter 8, verse 29, Peter responds to Jesus saying, You are the Christ. Yet, when Jesus was sleeping in the boat on the Sea of Galilee and a storm came up, the disciples were afraid. We can remember this from Noel's sermon two weeks ago. They woke Jesus up and told him to do something. Jesus calmed the sea and said, Why are you afraid? Do you still have no faith? This is found in Mark chapter 40, or Mark chapter 4, verses 35 to 40. 
Later, even though Jesus had explained to them several times that he would suffer and be killed, but then be raised up, when Mary Magdalene went to the tomb, found it empty, and returned to tell the disciples, they refused to believe her. This is in Mark chapter 16, verse 11. And of course, Thomas needed to feel the scars in Jesus' hand in order to believe it was really him. Number four, they lacked commitment. Peter and the disciples swore they would stay committed and never forsake Jesus. Yet in the garden, when Jesus asked them to watch and pray, they fell asleep. Several times this happened. And then later on, when Jesus was betrayed, they all scattered in fear of their lives. Number five, the disciples lacked power. I had mentioned about Matthew chapter 10, verse 1. Jesus gave his disciples power and authority to cast out evil spirits and to heal every kind of disease and illness. Yet later on in Matthew chapter 17, verses 14 through 17, they were unable to perform these miracles. A man came and knelt before Jesus and said, Lord, have mercy on my son. He has seizures and suffers terribly. He often falls into the fire or into the water. So I brought him to your disciples, but they couldn't heal him. Jesus said, you faithless and corrupt people, how long must I put up with you? Bring the boy here to me. He rebuked the spirit and it left him. And as Jesus was planning to return to the Father, he knew his disciples would need power after he was gone. So he promised them a comforter, the Holy Spirit, to come. We see this in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. These twelve were like us, no better, no worse. They were not wealthy. They did not have a good education. They weren't known for great acts of heroism. They were not qualified for the calling they were given, at least by the world's standards. But they were willing followers. Throughout the Bible, God used imperfect people, people with flaws. Moses stuttered. David's armor didn't fit. David also had an affair and then committed murder to cover it up. Jacob was a liar. Solomon was too rich. Abraham was too old. Timothy was too young. Naomi was a widow. Gideon, along with Thomas, was a doubter. Jeremiah suffered from depression, as did Elijah. Martha was a worrywart. Mary was lazy. Moses had a short fuse. So did Peter. God used imperfect people throughout history, and he, he can use you and me today, even though we have warts and flaws. Just last night, Nancy told me, I have two main flaws. Number one, I don't listen very well. And number two, um, I can't remember what the second one was. <laughs> but God doesn't look at a resume. He doesn't even need a job interview. He sees what we can be in him, not what we have been in the past. Satan tries to convince us we're not good enough. But Jesus says, I am your good enough. 
Satan looks back and sees our mistakes. God looks back and sees the cross. For an application, I want to read from a devotional by Paul David Tripp. Admit it, you don't like being weak. It's not fun being the last one chosen to play on a team. It's embarrassing to be asked a question you can't answer. It's frustrating not to be able to figure out the directions for assembling the furniture you just bought. It's mortifying to forget that important appointment or the name of a good friend. It's humbling to fail at a task, to drop the ball, or to make a promise and not be able to keep it. We don't like getting lost or forgetting a phone number. We all hate those moments when we feel unqualified or unprepared. We don't like being confused or not knowing. We covet the brains and muscles of others. We all hate being afraid and wish we had more courage. In the face of heroes, we feel anything but. In the face of accomplishments of others, we wonder if we have done much that's worthwhile. We don't like facing the truth that we're weak in our own ways. It is a universal condition of humanity. In a world where you have in a world where you have no one to turn to for strength and few who accept it who and few who accept you when you don't have it weakness is a thing to be avoided but here is what we need to understand weakness is not the big danger to be avoided what we need to avoid is our delusions of strength those assessments of independent strength are much more dangerous. Does this confuse you? The fact is that we are all weak. We are weak in wisdom, weak in strength, weak in righteousness. Sin has left us weak of heart and hands. It has left us feeble and lame in many ways. But God's grace makes weakness a thing to be feared no longer. The God of grace who calls you to himself and calls you to live for him blesses you with all the strength you need to do what he's called you to do. The way to enter into that strength is to admit how little strength you actually have. Grace frees me from being devastated that I can no longer trust me because grace connects me to the one who is worthy of my trust and who will always deliver what I need. Some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. They will collapse and fall, but we rise and stand upright. Psalm chapter 20, verses 7 and 8. This message was for me as much as it was for you. I need to be constantly re reminded that it's not about me being good enough, because I never will be. I need to rely on Jesus. He is my good enough. If I could summarize this message in one sentence, it would be, God can use us, sometimes even in spite of ourselves. A young boy traveling by airplane to visit his grandparents sat beside a man who happened to be a seminary professor. The boy was reading a Sunday school take-home paper and the professor thought he'd have some fun with the, with the lad. Young man, the professor said, if you can tell me something God can do, I'll give you a big, shiny apple. 
The boy thought for a moment. Then he replied, Mister, if you can tell me something God can't do, I'll give you a whole barrel of apples. Let's pray. Who am I that the Lord of all the earth would care to know my name, would care to feel my hurt? Who am I that the bright and morning star would choose to light the way for my ever-wandering heart? Not because of who I am, but because of what you've done. Not because of what I've done, but because of who you are. Thank you, Lord, for your grace and mercy. Thank you for being there to pick me up when I stumble. May I trust you more and not rely on myself. May I, as General Booth stated, be willing to give you all there is of me. In your name I pray, amen. Lee. Thank you, Roland. Now is the time for sharing. Um, does anybody have anything to share? If so, please raise your hand and Doug will bring you the mic. I have two messages from Nelson this morning. The first one is that Lois and Rachel's brother-in-law, Paul Yoder, has suffered a stroke. He is currently in the Pottstown Hospital. Um, we don't have much more of an update than that, other than they're waiting for an MRI on Monday. So we ask that you keep them in prayer. Um, Nelson also said that he wants to express his gratitude for the church for so many birthday wishes. You folks are dear to me in June, and yes, we miss all of you as well. Thank you. This is Joan Sala. <clears throat> if you noticed uh, the bulletin board outside the library, uh, I put a, I keep an update there of how much money my coins count has brought in, and I, it says $173. But Ruth told me that she also got some $150 in the offering for my coins count. So we have a total of $300. $23, which makes me very happy. And we have this Sunday and next Sunday yet for you to bring in your coins and dollar bills or whatever. The other thing is uh, there's a family day bowling, and I have a bowling ball at home that if anybody's interested and has hands as small as mine, <laughs> um, you're welcome to have it. It even comes with a bowling bag. <laughs> this is Roland Kolb. Um, this past Thursday, my brother Phil was blessed by getting a new kidney, and he is doing well. Um, he hooked up with uh, somebody that knew somebody that knew somebody that wanted to donate a kidney. And so the donor is doing well, and my brother Phil is doing well also. And in fact, I think he, I talked to him yesterday. Um, he's feeling, he's feeling noticeably better already. And the doctors are planning to send him home today. Okay, not, not seeing any more. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you for the reminder that you are magnificent. The creator of the universe. Help us, Father, to depend on you. Help us to hear your voice. Help us, Father, to 
walk in your ways. Father, we lift up Paul to you. We we ask for wisdom for the doctors and for the medical team that is intending him. And we ask for healing and comfort, peace. Bless him, Father. Bless those who care and love him as well. Father, we thank you for the successful kidney transplant. We ask that you bless both Phil and and the donor as well. In all things, we give thanks, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. For announcements, um, as Joan mentioned, Saturday there's a family day at J. Lane's at 3.45 p.m. And Joan, I must admit I have the opposite problem. My hands are bigger than the bowling balls that I can actually lift and throw. (laughs) I'm always looking for that bowling ball that has big enough holes that I can put my hands in and is light enough that I can actually throw. (laughs) That seems to be the dilemma. But at any rate, uh, if you have one with large holes and light, I'll take that. (laughs) Uh, uh, The other uh, announcement is that there's a Zoom prayer meeting on Wednesday at 7 p.m. Uh, does anybody else have any any announcements? This is Barb Sanchez. I just wanted to add a little bit of details um, about uh, Saturday evening for bowling. Um, it is a family evening special that they have on um, on Saturdays after f- uh, four, four and later, and um, so they they give a lane and shoes. Um, for $35, and you're allowed five people on the lane, which comes to $7 a person. So I just wanted to give you that information um, so you come prepared and um, look forward to having a good evening. Oh, and please sign up so I know how many lanes. I've already said we'll get three lanes, but if we need more than that, I'll need to arrange that. Good morning, this is Doug Kern. Uh, Just a reminder, we're gonna have a quick council meeting after church. I'll try to keep it to 15 minutes, hopefully, maybe a half hour at most for those who can attend. Council meeting. Not seeing any others, um, I invite the worship team up for a final song. I invite you to stand, and in your Sing the Journey book, number 29, You Are All We Have. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, 
To him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen.